Good morning or good afternoon for those entering the webinar room already. Um, we just uh, opened, so I'm going to wait just for a little bit uh, until we start. Give it a minute so that people can, uh, can enter our webinar room. Thank you so much for being with us uh, today. Yes, well, it's uh, one minute past nine in the morning in the Netherlands, and it's, uh, of course, just after five o'clock in, in Japan. Welcome to you all. Um, very happy uh, to everybody who has been able to join our session uh, titled uh, Digital for Development Cooperation uh, Towards Coordinated Cooperation uh, Between the EU and Japan, uh, question mark. Uh, we would, uh, we're very happy that you joined us on this Valentine's evening in Japan. Uh, on your morning, Monday morning, start of the week uh, here in the Netherlands. So it's a, a sort of a challenging time of our, uh, of our meeting. Um, but we're talking about, I think, uh, an up and coming topic uh, that in Japan and in Europe is gaining uh, increasing traction. Um, so we are hoping to, uh, with our discussion, to contribute to more action um, in this field uh, by policymakers with a better understanding of the uh, concepts and the, uh, the challenges facing countries like uh, the EU and Japan. Um, my name is Maika Okuno Heimans. I am a senior research fellow at the Klingendal Institute in The Hague, and I will be your moderator in this session. Um, I will introduce to you in a second uh, our, our excellent panel of two um, academics and two practitioners uh, that will get us started um, on this exciting topic. And then we'll move to a plenary discussion, of course, with everybody in the audience. Um, so if you're joining us in the Zoom session, uh, do ask your questions in the chat um, and we will get to that in a second. If you're joining us on, on YouTube, um, you can um, perhaps send in uh, your conversation, your, your contributions uh, at a later point of time because we cannot facilitate, unfortunately, questions through that. Um, Media. Um, so the aim of our webinar today is to contribute to an improved understanding of current developments in this really exciting field of what we in Europe call digital for development or what some can, would call digital development cooperation and specifically what the Netherlands and the EU are doing in this field and what Japan is doing in this field. Um, so what are the opportunities for synergies and coordination and perhaps even cooperation um, between these two partners um, to contribute to the development of uh, um, digital development uh, of countries uh, and to enhance their resilience also, digital resilience, um, while we, of course, are implementing the EU-Japan connectivity partnership that was concluded back in 2019. Um, we will specifically look at the Indo-Pacific region uh, and to Europe's own uh, neighboring region, Africa, uh, where the needs, I think, are the highest and where the stakes for both Japan and Europe are very high. Um, last year, we saw here in Europe the release um, of the Indo-Pacific strategy um, and of Global Gateway, which was sort of Europe's uh, connectivity 2.0 agenda. And with these uh, two strategies, the EU committed to greater action in the field of digital connectivity and in the Indo-Pacific. And Japan is, of course, an important partner of the EU in this field, as was made clear by that uh, digital or by the connectivity partnership that was concluded a few years ago, uh, and Japan was Europe's first partner in that sense. Um, we know, of course, that dealing with that digital transition and digital connectivity is an important element of dealing with the digital transition, um, is also on the agenda this week, actually, of the EU Africa Summit um, that is being held uh, just this week, um, as the EU is seeking to reestablish its, uh, its relationship with that continent. Um, so how is the EU really going to go about that? And how does digital feature in this broad relationship? Um, the question is really what is already being done and what can it be done better um, even? And can we get to uh, deliver more if we cooperate? Um, to kickstart our discussions, we will have introductory statements. Um, and uh, I will, would love to invite you immediately to our four panelists. 
Um, so first we'll be speaking to us uh, is Professor Wilhelm Vosser. Good morning uh, or good afternoon for you. I know you're based in Tokyo, of course. Um, you're at the uh, International Christian University uh, where you specialize in politics and international relations. And you also since last year act as the chair of the Department of Politics and International Studies. Um, you have a special interest, of course, in, in cybersecurity and in cyber diplomacy. Um, and you've been working, I think, in the past few years on pushing this topic further in EU-Japan relations, digital development cooperation. Um, so we would love to hear from you the sort of the what and why and how of digital uh, development cooperation to get us started with this uh, topic. Um, then we will turn to Professor Michiko Izika um, of the National Institute, the Graduate Institute for Policy Studies, also based in Tokyo. Uh, she's a specialist in science, technology, and innovation um, in developing countries specifically. Uh, and prior to joining uh, GRIPS, the institute is built in, in Japanese uh, in 2019. She actually worked in, uh, in the Netherlands uh, with an affiliation, of course, to the United Nations University uh, attached to, to Maastricht University here in the Netherlands. Um, and there she was involved in the training also of policymakers in developing countries on the very topic of science, technology, and innovation. Um, so that's a nice bridge to our two practitioners who are joining us also from Tokyo and from The Hague. Uh, first is uh, Ms. Mayumi Miyata, um, our director uh, at the Office uh, of STI and Digital Transformation at the Japan International Cooperation Agency. Uh, very warm uh, after the evening, I should say to you, uh, Ms. Miyata. Um, and of course, this is a relatively new department at JICA, so we're very excited to have you here and to hear from you what Japan is doing. Um, she brings actually experience uh, with uh, also working as an ICT and a management consultant in a global firm. Um, and then she also uh, worked in the field in Bhutan and Cambodia in the field of ICT for development. So I think that's a wonderful combination of both uh, well, private sector and, and local and now public sector experience that she will bring to the debate. Um, and then last but not least, uh, turning back to The Hague uh, for, uh, to hear from Mr. Bart Veenstra, who is the policy coordinator for digitalization for development at the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, welcome to you, uh, Bart. Um, and of course, at the MFA, you have been a driving force behind the international programs focused on digitalization and emergency support. Um, uh, oh no, that's your background, of course, um, in, in, of course, in uh, emergency support and media sustainability. Um, but now you work on this uh, on this new program also in the Netherlands um, and with ties to the EU. So then in the actually in, in Brussels, we have a digital for development hub. The Netherlands does not have a person there in Brussels, but we have close links with the team there that is uh, actually consists of, of EU officials and member state officials. The Netherlands engages with that. And the news is that we will have an, a digital for development Asia hub there soon also. So we'd love to hear from you uh, about uh, what do you think are the opportunities here, the shared interest, um, and uh, perhaps reasons for Japan and the EU and the Netherlands specifically to cooperate in this field. Um, that was a very long scene setting, of course, uh, and, and, and panel uh, panelist introduction. Uh, but I would love to, uh, to turn to our first speaker, uh, Wilhelm. Um, you will get us started, as I said, with the what, why, and how of digital development cooperation. What are, what are we really talking about? Why is it uh, actually important? Uh, and what can be done in the field? Or what is being done and what could be done better? Thank you so much for being with us. Over to you, Wilhelm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maike. And thank you for the Klingenthal Institute uh, for inviting me and for this elaborate uh, panel here. I try to do my best uh, to give you a broad overview uh, um, to the topic and uh, the concept of digital development cooperation. So traditional, traditional, the focus of development cooperation has long been on education, health, traffic, infrastructure, energy, energy supply. In addition, also it has a strategic component to have some impact maybe on political rights, human rights, democratization. But the success, of course, of uh, development cooperation in general very much depends on the government of the time in the receiving country. The ongoing digital transformation provides a fundamental shift. Digitalization means global digitalization. While the internet became beneficial and changed our world because it gives access to information or market opportunities worldwide, digitalization 
is still at different stages at different countries. While the internet appears global because global IT standards about routers who can speak to each other and the speed and level of access, uh, well, the speed of level of access, of course, in different countries is still very different. There is still, to some degree, a digital divide. Some countries have fully developed and developing among, developed and developing among them have developed and embraced digitalization and reaped the full benefit. But there are still major discrepancies here. This is where Digital Development Corporation comes in. It is supposed to help countries, developing countries and emerging economies to get the full benefit of digital, digital transformation. However, digital, trans, uh, digital Development Corporation is not a neutral endeavor. It is part of a shifting global power balance, the US-China tech conflict, and an ongoing conflict about norms and standards in the digital domain. Digital Development Corporation includes assistance with design and implementation of ICT systems, for example, but very important in this context is also capacity building. In the sense, Digital Development Corporation has a hardware side and a software side. The hardware side, to some degree, is actually building or helping to build communication infrastructure, but the software side is equally important, is to help building certain norms and regulations. And some of the key words here are probably data autonomy and privacy. So what distinguishes uh, Digital Development Corporation from traditional development corporation, for example, cyber capacity building or OACD development assistance or the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals is that it's more comprehensive and more inclusive. It goes beyond cyber capacity building or technical assistance or simply ICT infrastructure developments and loans and public-private pub, uh, public partnership. It bridges the gap that often exists between technical development, political, business and governing approaches of development corporations. There are also close links to business uh, diplomacy, science and technology diplomacy and cyber diplomacy. So why is this issue uh, got this issue so much attention in the last few years? Well, one reason is obviously the increased attention and the importance of the digital transformation, as I just said, uh, in businesses and e-government and e-health and generally the importance of access to data. But that's not where we are at the moment. In a nutshell, there are two different visions of the Internet. One vision is, in a sense, the continuation of the original vision of the Internet of, from the 1990s, which is global, which gives access to data and information in other countries and is relatively limited in terms of government regulation. On the other hand, there is a, a vision of the Internet or cyberspace that basically gives full control or a lot of control to governments. It undermines privacy, severely restricts open discourse, and strengthens government control of their own people. The key word here is oftentimes digital authoritarianism. So while developing corporation has been working with semi-democratic or authoritarian governments for decades, emerging technologies, especially gatekeeper technologies like 5G networks, cannot only be misused by the respective government of the time, but also gives third countries which install or run these networks potentially access to data of people in these countries. And this is where Digital Development Corporation has to respond in some way and is targeting it. So the next question that you ask and that is relevant in this context here is why should the EU or why generally a focus on the Indo-Pacific from the European side in recent years in particular? So the regional focus of European development corporations as well as digital development assistance programs like the Digital uh, for Development uh, D4D or other projects with the African Union, for example, has been the African continent. And the central reason is still the existing digital divide in Africa, which is in dire need 
for more ICT investment because only 33% of individuals have access to the internet. However, the digital divide is not a core problem in the Asia Pacific, where 60% of the population has actually access to the internet. Why then should the EU focus its development, uh, digital development cooperation more on the Asia Pacific or Indo-Pacific? Well, there are basically three reasons. One is the geostrategic shift towards the Indo-Pacific, with half of all consumers, a growing economic power, technological leadership in some of these countries, and of course, generally the rise of China. The Indo-Pacific now produces 62% of the world's GDP, while the EU produces only 15%. An increasing number of leading technologies or technology companies are located in the region. And even more importantly for digital development cooperation, 50% of worldwide internet users live in Asia. Only 20% live in Europe. Point number two would be why the Indo-Pacific is that China now is one of the leading producers uh, in many emerging technologies, from ICT communication technologies, more broadly 5G, to artificial intelligence. With the Made in China strategy, China aims at becoming the global technological leader for a whole range of future technologies. With its digital Silk Road, it has become the go-to technology partner for many countries in the Indo-Pacific. And thirdly, Europe and like-minded country, countries in the Indo-Pacific, and this is predominantly uh, Japan with the already mentioned Partnership for Sustainable Connectivity, are ideal partners for, to push for the openness, transparency, and inclusiveness basically giving a playing uh, level, level playing field for businesses and a rules-based connectivity. And the fourth question basically that is related to this, uh, what do we hope to hear? What are the recent developments from the EU? You will hear more uh, in detail from other speakers, but what has already been going on is that the EU and Japan are, of course, strong proponents for the free and open and rules-based cybersecurity and are actively cooperating in a number of international uh, forum uh, in the United Nations, um, for example, but also in the G20 with Japan's Osaka call, for example, or the European Paris call. But there were both sides are still quite weak when it comes to Europe and Japan, quite weak when it comes to actual ICT investment. The existing funding from the European Investment Bank pales in comparison to Chinese investment. The EU so far has wi widely uh, neglected the basic elements of building hard infrastructure. In a nutshell, the problem is that poorer economies and poorer countries have to choose basically between, in quotation marks, sustainable, but oftentimes maybe more expensive products uh, or whole IT systems by European manufacturers and ready-made Chinese packages. Um, and they will very often go for the Chinese package. And thirdly, the EU and Japan uh, why they should work together is because the EU and Japan have basically independent expertise in improving digital skills in less so-called cyber uh, mature markets. Japan's experience is here in the National Center for Incident Readiness and Strategy for Cybersecurity is active in the ASEAN Japan Cybersecurity Capacity Building Center in Bangkok, for example. The EU through the EU and ASEAN programs, the Asian um, Regional Forum, the ARF, or through ASEM in the work of capacity building. But some of this falls, some of this falls under capacity building, but cyber uh, uh, development cooperation or digital development cooperation is more than just training. Uh, it would also include loans and grants 
more public-private partnership, and perhaps financial and other EU support for European hardware and software and manufacturers in order to expand their market share in the Indo-Pacific. The European key word very often here is human, the human-centered approach to regulation uh, in terms of data, in terms of privacy, in terms of artificial intelligence that promotes an openness, inclusiveness and transparency. On a final note, I would say that the EU and Japan are both in a very similar position geostrategically right now. Both used to be major global technological entrepreneurs who dominated a wide range of IT technologies. However, in the digital transformation, they are falling behind and lose not only market influence, but more importantly, in the context of digital development cooperation, the influence on norms, standards, and values. There's now a strong shift away from the liberal world order towards a more authoritarian system. The EU and Japan and other like-minded middle powers are therefore kind of in danger of losing this conflict. And I think this is a very strong reason why there needs to be more cooperation, especially in this field, and helping slightly less developed economies or emerging economies uh, in this field. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Wilhelm, for a, a very clear message, I think, and a very strong call for, for more coordination, of course, between the EU and the member states and Japan. Um, you, you started from the digital divide, highlighting you know, what is really at stake for developing countries, and you ended with what is at stake for us as well. So there's really a, a very diversity of reasons to act. There's many uh, issue areas to act, the hardware and the software you mentioned. Um, and I'm very curious to hear from the other speakers, of course, uh, how they feel about this and what particular elements should be emphasized because digital development cooperation is, is it seems from your uh, expose, uh, one element in a bigger package of you know, infrastructure development that may require financing from, from financial institutions. Um, so let's try and understand that bigger picture. Um, and, and move on with that also to our second uh, speaker, uh, Professor Izaka. Well, we, for, we agreed to go on first name basis, so I'll go with uh, Michiko. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we're looking forward to hear from you on um, you know, the geopolitical context in, in which Japan operates and its approach to development cooperation, or perhaps more specifically, uh, science, technology and innovation, which is, of course, your particular field of expertise. Um, and uh, perhaps you can share with us some of the lessons that we can learn from what Japan has been doing. Uh, you know, is there some things that here in Europe we do different? Um, and areas where we could uh, bind forces uh, to bring better results. So, over to you. Hey, well, thank you very much, Maike, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And I think it's a wonderful uh, panel and also a wonderful uh, seminar to be here, uh, to be um, participating. And I hope that I can contribute uh, to uh, following on to the great presentation uh, given by Wilhelm. Okay, um, what I would like to go, I think is a little bit uh, kind of zoom in to what's actually happening. And then I would show some figures. Okay, this is the amount of SDI in ODA. There was the ones that we needed to calculate with the World Bank. How much of the ODA is dedicated to SDI, which is science, technology, and innovation? It is a very difficult calculation. So I think that there are different versions of this kind of calculation probably going around because there's no marker, de defined marker for SDI. So what we did was that we have to divide all the project into uh, different uh, groups and then calculate it. So what we have found out is that it's not a lot but then it's more or less relevantly a little bit similar in terms of the proportion to the country, um, Japan as well as UK, uh, Germany, France, uh, um, they are contributing to uh, the STI. Now, what is different is uh, what sort of things that they are actually spending to. And uh, when you look, I think th this requires a lot of time to examine, uh, but uh, uh, what it seems, that there is an attention to ICT sectors uh, in Korea and France and Japan. On and, and the right-hand side, it is technology, and the left-hand side is science and innovation. And the science is more to do with research. Uh, 
And uh, there are research uh, cooperation in perhaps in the UK and France, but there are also uh, that digital component. I mean, this is just to show how things are differently kind of organized. Maybe you want to turn to the next slide for that, or yes. can you have a slide? Yes. And well, and um, the science and diplomacy, that there was also a, a talk about the science. And science diplomacy, there are three types, science and diplomacy, and diplomacy for science, and science for diplomacy. Now, uh, when we look at the diplomacy for science, which is to dealing with diplomacy to promote scientific cooperation, and that is exactly what we are trying to look at. And in Japan, uh, there has been several attempts. I think that the, uh, perhaps the uh, next speaker uh, the, uh, in the next section would uh, touch upon, which is at SATREP, that is the Science and Technology Research Partnership that was given uh, from JICA, JST, AMET. Uh, what, is, what they do is that they try to uh, collaborate in scientific research with the developing countries. So this is more based on the science. And they, um, there are also identification of a strategic area of science and security. So cyber is one of them, but then uh, together alongside, uh, there are space architect, as we see international collaboration in government and research. So these are the sort of areas where they uh, um, focus on. And the, um, the, the last bit that was also um, quite important is that um, a data flow of trust. Uh, this is the sort of like idea proposed in the G20 in Osaka in 2019, when the Japan was uh, acting as a presidency. And they were actually seek to enable cross-border free flow of data while addressing concerns over privacy, data protection, intellectual property rights, and security. And so I think this is very much along the way that uh, Wilson was kind of explaining that there are some sort of concern about the, um, how the data protection should be and there is uh, and, and, uh, property rights and security. And then how these, ensuring these would actually enable free flow of data. Um, and uh, let me just kind of want to um, differentiate what the difference between science, technology, innovation, because I study about science and technology innovation, but then when I thought about, okay, ICT, uh, there are some differences. I mean, both are public goods, knowledge or interoperative platform. And the critical path for the SDI is to create and research and then commercialize them in the market. ICT is a technology to become a platform, kind of like an infrastructure that becomes interoperative and connectivity is uh, offering the better services or better welfare. Now, the critical failure uh, in the knowledge side will be a market failure in under uh, spending, under investing for knowledge creation. Whereas the ICT is on the other side, which is uh, because it's a government failure regulating the platform because there will be a tendency of the bads, which is the monopolistic or oligopolistic dominance of the platform. And why is it so important for regulating or to look uh, closely into what, uh, what is going to take place in, uh, in, in the platform is because of this externality that causes. The externality, there are three externalities, and externality number one is much to do with actually what they do. Right? This is to offer the services. The externality number two will be going beyond the intended purposes. And then in, in case of ICT, it is data generation. It is not just transaction that the payment, a digital payment that is offered. And it is not just uh, um, uh, health, uh, e-health or um, e-free uh, uh, delivery, but it is the, the data generated through these activities and, and with an analytics, with the capability of analytics, they can actually transform the world where we are. And, and that is actually the quite uh, good thing, can, but it also can be a bad thing. And uh, um, as I think Wilhelm also had mentioned, that this goes beyond border, this goes beyond sectors, and these therefore requires to be a uh, uh, careful hand in how to govern them. And that would require uh, shared values or shared way of um, standards uh, uh, as well. Okay, so this is, and now looking into what's going on, with a platform, who is owning the a great, a big platform and who is actually um, having a less of it. I have to. So um, this is a share of total value by region. 
So here you can see a lot of America and a lot of big GAFA. And here, um, uh, the second largest is the Asian Pacific. A lot of, of them are China. And there are some emerging ones as uh, Wealth Moore also mentioning that they have, we have also seen some uh, in interesting uh, development of India, Indonesian, and also Korean platforms. But it's, it's a relatively small, but it's there. And uh, unfortunately, Japan has only two, and it's very relatively small. It's Rakuten and Merikari. So uh, they're in a lesser side. And then Europe is also a little bit smaller. I mean, there are some big ones, that are identifiable ones like SAP, um, but relatively smaller. What it means in the, the data is that the, they are the ones that the, uh, the um, uh, platforms are one that observes the data and they are the one they, they can make an analytics and influence the world. Whereas the, those who do not have, or who has a less of it, has a sitting on a different side, which is a, a data emitters. Now, what I would like to go um, to show um, in the last slide is the, um, who is analyzing, oops, oops. Um, who has the capability to analyze them. And this is a geographical distribution of uh, human resources in AI. And I, I'm talking about the very top notch um, uh, capabilities of people. And uh, here is a uh, top 25 institutions for the top tier AI research. And then this is according to the number of research paper published. And you can see uh, a lot of United States, a uh, lot of, and then some of the, uh, uh, and some China, uh, some Europe but uh, dominantly it's in U US. And this is also a geographical distribution of AI researchers by countries and work of origin. Uh, so this is, a work of, uh, this is a country of origin and that there are um, a lot of them are working in the United States and China and, and some and in Europe. So what I'm trying to say is that and there are very, very few and I don't think there is any uh, mark in, in, in Japan. So, there, um, so what we are trying to say, which is also similar to what Wilson was saying, that is that the, in Japan, I think that there are um, um, in a weak side of kind of having AI um, uh, skills in doing analytics or generate, and it's not also generating, uh, it's, it is generating a data, however, it is not uh, using them, absorbing them. And, but so these actually put maybe a Japan, EU, and also the developing countries well, except for China, um, in the uh, similar footing with regards to thinking about how to govern the digital technologies and how to govern the consequences of uh, digital connectivity. So um, I think this is all from, from me and I'll give it back to Maike. Thank you so much, uh, Michiko, for, for zooming in on, uh, on STI science and technology and innovation and, and comparing that to, to ICT. Um, it somehow feels like that software hardware distinction that, uh, that, that Wilhelm was also pointing to, uh, where, where the ICT and, and regulatory challenges and the, and the norms and, and economic competitiveness uh, behind uh, that uh, yeah, as, as, a, as a challenge for, for both the EU and Japan, as well as for developing countries is highlighted. Um, and of course, a way to address that also is, is by building professional digital skills. And I think that is what SDI is aiming for um, also, right? Um, and and the, the graph you showed, I think, of the, the, the dominance by uh, US and Chinese uh, companies uh, shows indeed uh, that, to, that we have a shared challenge um, and, uh, well, and, and uh, well, a reason then to, to work um, and with uh, developing countries also. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, I, I saw some questions coming in in the chat uh, already, and I do encourage, of course, everybody present uh, to pull in uh, more. Um, but I, uh, at the same time, would like to uh, give first the floor to our uh, two practitioner speakers, actually. 
um, who have been waiting patiently. Uh, Bart, uh, we will turn to you second, uh, but first we will go to Mayumi uh, to hear what Japan is doing in this field of digital development cooperation. Um, and what are the focus areas that this new um, directorate that uh, Mayumi is, is leading um, uh, is really doing? Um, and does Japan with, work with partners? We are curious to hear, of course, also. And, and you know, do you see any benefits to working uh, with the EU or EU member states, if not now, perhaps in the future? Um, over to Tokyo again. Thank you so much for being with us, Mayumi. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, having me this opportunity to participate and uh, very nice to meet you all. Um, I'd like to, can you see my slides? Yes, we see them all. Yes. Okay, great. So um, my name is Mayumi Miyata, director uh, for the SDI and DX uh, uh, office, and then I'm uh, in charge of the, the digital for development program in JICA. And from my side, I'd like to briefly explain uh, you the overview of what um, we are, are doing right now um, uh, in this uh, field and highlight some key opportunities and challenges that we ha we face and hoping to discuss uh, yeah the, the themes that that have been set by two, sp two sp great speakers uh, that we had before so this slide shows an overview and um, here on the left hand side it shows uh, the, our kind of goal here, uh, digital trans uh, our goal is to um, use the digital transformation to improve the uh, well-being for one and for all. And we are kind of um, using a two-layer uh, approach. Uh, I mean, yeah, three-layer approach, which cater both positive and negative sides of digitalization. And um, yes, of course, as uh, we have highlighted, we'd like to assist countries to harness the opportunities while taking care of the threats. Um, in line, this is, um, yeah, here. And then in line with this approach, we have two types of work. On the top, uh, we have, um, um, have uh, yes, the newly set up team, which I lead to drive the digital transformation across sectors. Uh, JICA has around Yes, the 500 projects under uh, under the implementation across the world at a time. And our team is working as a kind of like internal consulting team uh, to bring in the digital components to enhance the impact of our cooperation. And another team is uh, implementing the project to create the enabling environment um, here under uh, and then. Yes. Uh, the, the, the three components to this ICT ecosystem, uh, digital skills and business, and then cybersecurity. And the recent uh, focus here is that we um, have um, cybersecurity um, programs to promote free and open secure cyberspace in partner countries under the uh, DFFT, as mentioned earlier. Uh, the for, and then the here, as, um, as we have mentioned, that uh, we focus on ASEAN countries and other Asian countries uh, and um, at, at this moment. But uh, I think the government is also uh, thinking of expanding the scope as well. And here the, um, on the top side for the uh, this digital transformation across the sectors, uh, we are trying to kind of create a key use case that we don't limit into any sector or any region. We, we have just started and we are trying to um, sh uh, showcase uh, some of the benefits that digitalization can bring in. And here uh, we have a lot of uh, partners. Uh, I mean, as JICA, we don't have technology uh, within us, so we have to co collaborate with others. And of course, uh, we welcome uh, the collaboration with other development partners. I brought uh, two uh, examples for the each uh, type of work. Uh, so, so this is a healthcare uh, use case that we are implementing right now under the COVID. Uh, it's a D2D telemedicine, which connects doctors and nurses in Japan and partner hospitals with vital data, uh, vital data sharing system. Like, uh, yeah, through the PC, you can see the uh, the, the vital data at the uh, real time and providing advice and remote training in the field of intensive care. And this is a, pro a project that we developed, uh, uh, especially for uh, the uh, COVID-19 uh, measures. And 
So the next slide shows our cooperation for cybersecurity. So here on the uh, top, uh, as arrow shows, this is a kind of status where we, we will look at the status where the country are at, uh, and then we try to um, see where we can, uh, where to, uh, where is the entry point for our cooperation. But we mainly focus on the capacity building side, and also uh, like a national uh, cybersecurity incident response team um, to to be set up in each um, uh, countries. And he, I highlighted some countries that we are uh, cooperating at the moment. And uh, we have a, a program, I mean, the projects in each and every country that are like highlighted like Myanmar, Vietnam, Bangladesh, Mongolia, Cambodia. And also we cooperate with the ASEAN as Secretariat to have a more uh, a regional cooperation in this, um, in this field. Um, the opportunities and challenges uh, from the practitioner side. Um, this is my last slide. Uh, there's a high momentum in digital development, and it's also intensified uh, under a COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and the opportunity is uh, great, and a lot of, uh, uh, um, yeah, there's uh, also a potential uh, needs uh, in mainstreaming digital technology and the use of data in each and every sector and project. Um, and and for these uh, opportunities, uh, I see some challenges that many practitioners are still in the realm of physical space and have limited imagination on the cyberspace. And uh, we see, I see a lot of challenge exist in breaking the walls between sectors. And because the digital we is better when we work across the sectors, but we have we have quite challenge in that. And the third point, which leads to the, the theme of this um, uh, seminar, is that I think the many governments, we feel that are seeking a tangible cooperation, but also they're paying more attention to the data security. security. And of course, the, um, the, for the government um, in, uh, introducing the products, uh, Uh, from China, for example, uh, the, the only for uh, maybe private sector, but uh, some um, uh, findings like that. And so we are faced with challenges um, to meet the expectations uh, the governments are looking for, and it's quick and tangible. Uh, but um, also we like to share a common uh, concept and values such as DFFT, and it, which might take some time. So this um, many uh, government I think they are uh, caught in the middle between affordability and security. Um, and then I think they're seeking a third option in that context. I think the cooperation between uh, EU member states or EU secretariat, uh, I think will be, would, would be a great benefit. So this is it from my side and back to you, Mikey. Thank you so much, uh, Mayumi, for that. Uh, making things, you know, this is more uh, understandable. What are we actually talking about? Uh, I really like your the healthcare case and, and the cybersecurity case. And it's uh, it really it makes it clear what we are talking about here and what Japan has been doing um, and in what countries, of course. Um, I have to admit, I lost you for a second when you were starting to talk about normative issues. Let's hope that's not a breach of our oh. cybersecurity here in this webinar. Uh, but I think you, your um, your point was uh, was made very clear. We heard most of uh, most of it. So I just missed a little bit. Um, but I think in, indeed this is uh, this is not just for economic competitiveness, um, but it's also very much a normative issue. And uh, um, it's important to keep that in mind. Although we don't want to put that. Uh, you know, up, up front in, of course, in, in our actions, because that's to deliver um, to the to the needs, um, the practical needs also of these uh, developing countries. Um, so um, let's turn to our final speaker to to get the full picture uh, and, and understand also the Dutch uh, and hopefully also a little bit of the EU view on this topic uh, from Bart Veenstra. Um, Bart, um, please, uh, well, enlighten us on what's happening on this uh, on this topic in in the Netherlands. Um, what are we doing, uh, both internally or reorganizing ourselves? We heard of the the challenge of breaking the walls, uh, you know, between the different departments. Uh, that's probably an issue also in in, in the Netherlands, um, and uh, even perhaps even more challenging because we have that EU level than than also. Um, and what is uh, the EU doing, uh, is the Netherlands doing in third countries? 
Thank you, Micah. Um, and um, uh, thank you also for the, the excellent speakers that were before me. Uh, we already covered a lot of ground that uh, I don't have to cover anymore in my uh, little speech. Um, just to give you a little bit of background on where the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the Netherlands is standing. Um, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has been around for a very long time, of course, and our development uh, department has been around since the 60s and has grown since those days into where we are today for uh, uh, main topics that we cover in respect to development cooperation. Things like humanitarian uh, action, social development, green development and economic development. And over the past years, um, we've, like the rest of the world, we've, we've more and more noticed that digitalization is taking over also the development programs. Um, it's uh, no longer only about tools, but more and more about the whole context in which development cooperation takes place. Um, maybe also good to say that uh, the, uh, the, the ministry focuses in its development e efforts on mainly Africa and the MENA region, so neighboring countries of Europe, um, 27 countries. And at the moment, unfortunately, none of them of the focus countries are in Asia. Um, but I'd like to continue uh, talking with the, the, the previous speakers also to get arguments on where, should we or should we not re-engage in uh, the rest of the world, especially in respect to uh, digital for development. Anyway, um, to come back to where we come from, so two, three years ago, we developed, uh, we decided to develop a digital agenda for development cooperation. Um, the reason for that was that we did not want to establish a separate department next to the four branches that we already have, um, uh, but like to uh, streamline uh, digitalization in all our programs. Um, uh, the, the, we as the Dutch, we believe that digitalization is part of everything. It uh, doesn't really matter whether it's 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 uh, the supply of aid to Syrian refugees in Lebanon, or the uh, uh, the development of uh, green ecosystems in Tanzania. Um, there are there is digitalization in everything. Um, so we've been trying to do we have done an effort to streamline uh, digitalization within our development programs, which has been uh, difficult, I should say, and we we are still not there yet. Um, we, so, like I said, we, we did that through the uh, drafting of this digital agenda, in which we set out uh, a couple of focal points, uh, of which the main focal point is digital inclusion. So digital inclusion is something that we think about in every program that we do uh, on the ground. And also in engaging with uh, implementing partners, this is one of the things, the key things that we uh, measure impact with, um, because, it, because digitalization cannot be excluded from anything. Um, and then there is another thing about breaking down walls. Um, like I said, the development part of the ministry is not really engaged in the Asia Pacific at the moment, but we also have a part of the ministry which is focusing more on the security car side of, of things. And they are, they also have a development program uh, focused on cybersecurity, uh, also engaging in the, in the Asia Pacific. As far as I, my understanding is now, not directly with Japan, uh, but with many other members in the region, but that have a similar uh, perspective on uh, uh, how the internet should be. Um, uh, like Korea, for example, uh, we conduct trainings, uh, capacity development uh, in Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, like all over the region. Um, but it is a little bit separated and we're trying to break down those walls, uh, which is work in progress, I should say. Um, another thing, of course, is the European element in this. Um, we, and I think most European countries have realized that over the past years that if you want to compete also in, in, in Africa, uh, in the African continent, if you want to compete against the Americans on the one side and the uh, uh, Chinese mainly on the other side, you have to sort of like come together. Uh, you have to um, uh, put together uh, you, the funding you have uh, in respect to digitalization. You have to uh, work together and maybe even at the European level create new programs. So for development cooperation uh, in 2020, the Digital Food Development Hub was established. And that was mainly based on what I just said, like various countries noticing that uh, in country, let's say Tanzania or in Kenya, 
um, uh, various, pro various countries of the European Union were doing similar programs that were overlapping and not necessarily in synergy with each other. So the Digital Development Hub, uh, which is based in Brussels, but is now branching out. Uh, there's, there's Africa branch, and as Mike already said, uh, an Asia branch is to be established. Um, European countries, they basically put together their development effort in respect to uh, digital development cooperation and say like, hey, how can we make more impact by uh, putting together combined objectives rather than competing objectives? So this is one of the main things, and I, I foresee that in the coming years, the Digital for Development Hub um, and similar initiatives uh, will uh, be also for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs at the core of our Digital for Development program, together with uh, the streamlining of, of digitalization throughout the programs. I think the Digital for Development Hub will be at the core of, uh, of, of interventions. As I said, a lot of work is still to be done. Um, then. And, and I think I was also triggered by the picture. I think Wilhelm showed now, like uh, it was Michiko, I think, showed on her uh, on her slides where you see that there is a huge gap. Uh, Europe is sort of missing in Japan as well. And I think, again, also collaboration uh, can change that. And um, so, like I said, in Europe, we're doing that. But I think also outside of Europe, we should do that more. Um, so. Uh, maybe JICA and uh, the development branch of the ministry can look to synergies where we can, uh, in uh, the African continent, but also abroad, can, can, can combine our programming. Um, of course, we're already doing that via the uh, multilateral bodies that are around, like the World Bank, the OSCE. Um, there are also various platforms to coordinate the efforts in, in respect to cybersecurity. So this is, uh, I think this, this I'd be really uh, happy to uh, to continue this discussion after uh, this meeting to see where there is uh, ways to collaborate. Um, we are still inventing ourselves in respect to uh, digital uh, development in Africa and beyond, uh, but I think there is plenty of room um, to work together. Um, I, I think I would like to keep it with that, and I'm looking forward to the discussion, Mike. Thank you so much, uh, Bart, for uh, for explaining to us where where things stand in the Netherlands, where we're coming from, um, and uh, and and linking that to the EU. It almost almost sounds as if that experience with the the D4D hub, uh, where EU member states uh, are trying to coordinate actually their separate efforts, uh, you know, taking that to an even higher level. If we were to do that with developing partners, um, that you know we could even benefit from some that has been done uh, in, uh, in, in Brussels. Um, would you like to reflect on that just a little bit um, on, on the, you know, the difficulties? Because if you have had you know, programs ongoing for many years, um, you have of course staff that's uh, used to working on, on specific topics and not so much you know, digitalization was not part of that for, for, for many years uh, until recently. So trying to steer these people into doing different things and also then in different ways, that's, that's quite a lot at the same time, isn't it? It is. I mean, one of the challenges, uh, let, let me be very clear um, and, and transparent about where we're standing here, is that the, the Dutch development program is relatively small, of course. You know, we have limited capacity and uh, where we come from is that like everybody who is working in the ministry has a various, uh, has a specific uh, uh, objective, like, for example, uh, are working on programs that are tackling uh, humanitarian uh, things in, in, in Syria or in Turkey or, or somewhere in the region. Um, and then we are asking them basically to also look and uh, approach things from the digital perspective, like, hey, you know, that data of refugees, is, it's kept somewhere. So what the struggle is in the ministry right now is to, to uh, free up capacity for people to include digitalization in their work. So this is one of the struggles. And then at the European level, uh, uh, me and, and a colleague was also present today, we are basically the representatives of the ministry in those European bodies. Um, while, of course, we, we, we want, because there's thematic working groups uh, in the African continent on the digital development, hub, for example, on cybersecurity, we want uh, the expert colleagues to get involved there and, uh, and, and, and have the conversation at, on, at the table with uh, the European partners. Um, but at, the, at this ministry, there's still a lot to be done to free up capacity. And of course, in the ideal world, 
And I think uh, the, these, these thoughts are already being uh, uh, discussed is that the digital for development app is of course the, 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 the best uh, way also to, to see collaboration with countries like Japan or Korea or other like-minded countries in uh, the Asia Pacific region. But um, because it is where the Netherlands stands, there's a couple of countries in Europe that are a little bit ahead. There's a couple of countries that are behind. Um, uh, work in progress, I, 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 I am uh, confident that in the coming two years or so, uh, things will come together because we have to. This is the only way forward. Thanks for that. Yes, and I see uh, Mayumi laughing. So it, uh, the, the European interpretation would be that you recognize some of what uh, is being said here, right? Of what is uh, happening um, perhaps in, in the Netherlands. Um, did, did you want to re respond, uh, Mayumi, uh, to, to add a little bit? Um, because of course, you know, next to understanding better, you know, what digital for development is really about and why we should be doing, going certain places, just the, the very practical challenge of how do we get the right, you know, people with the with the skills uh, to to make this happen? How do we steer our policymakers also into understanding that this is important, that the change is made at the expense of what, right? Because uh, we also have to deal with limited staff uh, and, and and budgets. Um, so uh, yeah, I would love to hear um, everybody's uh, reflection on that uh, actually in a second. And in the meantime, I encourage uh, all our participants in, in, the, in the webinar, of course, to pose your questions um, in the chat. Um, I know that Henry, uh, Henry Chan, who's been in our call uh, from the very start, um, he uh, posed a question. If he's still here, um, Henry, do you want to just quickly turn on your screen and ask your, um, your, your question yourself? It's, it's about the hardware and the role of, of also um, the, the tech giants, the telecommunications companies in, uh, in investing more. Um, and uh, so the hardware really. Uh, Henry, are you still here or should I just read out uh, your oh, question? I, I'm here. Can ah, you hear wonderful. me? Yes, okay. we can hear you. We cannot see you. Yeah, it is about the Financial Times story today that uh, this uh, European telco CEO is asking EU to uh, to ask these uh, software providers, the platform providers, to help build the network, because that's exactly what Wilhelm is talking about. EU telco is not investing enough on these infrastructures today. And then uh, Michiko also talked about these platform monopoly issues. So how do you react to this uh, telco CEO's request in EU? Thank you, Henry, for, uh, for that question. Um, Michiko and, and Wilhelm, do you want to, uh, to respond to that? I'm tempted to also respond myself, but I, uh, as the moderator, I will refrain from doing so. Turn to Wilhelm first. No, please do so. <laughs> That's fine. That is, of course, an issue. I mean, I mentioned this issue as well. It's a question of investment. Uh, Michiko had this nice slide there. Uh, we have this overarching power of big tech giants, especially in the United States, but of course, increasingly in the Asia Pacific as well. Of course, China is a very, very big one here. And the Europeans play a very, very minor role here. And the question is indeed how we can change that. That cannot be changed overnight, obviously, and even over the next coming, coming years. Uh, at least not in terms of, of investment. The money isn't really there. There are relatively few companies. 5G would be like one topic where there are a few European uh, uh, companies that uh, do develop these technologies. But of course, uh, when it comes to the Indo-Pacific, there are not, they are a very, very small player. I mean, this is not like a seminar like on business opportunities per se. So as I said in my presentation, uh, digital development assistance is not, not just business diplomacy, so to say, so to um, provide the Indo-Pacific market in this specific case that we talk about, or maybe even the market in Africa for European investors. That is, of course, one element. It's one element, but it's not the core element here. But the core element, of course, that the Europeans so far stood on, stood on basically is we are good at norms, right? Uh, there's this Brussels effect, uh, the GDPR kind of became a quasi social, at least a model, it's not adopted everywhere, of course, but somehow, somehow a model. Um, but we are in some way overreaching as well. I mean, there are a few things I, I did not mention in my talk, but one of the as, as one of the problems in the Indo-Pacific 
is that while, of course, uh, Japan has been far more active among ASEAN countries or in, in the Indo-Pacific, and Japan, Europe should collaborate in a platform like uh, uh, D4D is obviously a very good start just to see what, what they are actually doing, what each other are doing. But one of the problems, of course, that we have seen in recent years where digital plays a specific part is the undermining of not just democratic political systems, but also the openness um, of the internet. And I was just, you know, in pre preparation for this talk as well, if you look at countries like Vietnam, Thailand, Myanmar, where according to, for example, Freedom House report of the openness of the internet, these countries are not free, and not just politically, but where the internet is not free. And then just a few weeks ago, two weeks ago or so, there, uh, Cambodia uh, was in the news. And I know that the Klingendal Institute has been working with Cambodia as well, that Cambodia now basically has decided to adopt a Chinese style um, f internet firewall, basically, and the country's kind of off. Myanmar is a specific example that, that's now, for the last two years, of course, has dropped off the list of countries that was on the verge of democratizing and where there was actually a lot of European help and capacity building in Myanmar as well. And now, of course, it's the military dictatorship basically that is using the infrastructure that was originally made, of course, to open up the country, digitally opening up the country, and of course can potentially misuse that knowledge that the Europeans with a number of projects in Myanmar uh, before 2015 in particular invested there. So that's always the tricky part where if you don't, I mean, technology, so the infrastructure, the hardware is one element if you can provide that. But even if you cannot really provide the hardware, if you can have some influence on the governing side, how the internet, cyberspace, data, privacy, so-called, is governed, uh, then that's, that's at least a start, because yes, the Europeans, hardware-wise, probably will not play a major role. And the similar, similar is true, as Michiko just said, for the Japanese, unfortunately, as well. So there, there is a problem here. And, but we have to be you know, urgently you know, developing more, uh, not just money, but expertise and working with these governments on digital because it's this overarching topic that's why we talk about this it's education is like one health is one and all these individuals ones but where we can bridge this expertise because it's kind of covering up everything we have now you know e-learning obviously and e-health and e-government and all these factors that used to be kind of separate through the digital link they kind of come together so to say it's not everything, but it's a part that links many of these parts together. So that's why it's so important to be part of it, part of the discussion at least. Thanks for that, uh, Wilhelm. It, it, indeed, and it's it's actually also getting us to the, you know, to the point where we have to consider the links between, you know, the digital for development uh, cooperation uh, as an instrument, as a policy tool for interventions uh, next to sort of financing instruments and, and trade and investment promotion even because you know yeah getting the telecommunications companies or assisting them uh, in, in, you know if they if they see opportunities in third countries uh, but perhaps not fast enough um, then or, or for other reasons uh, are left out um, you know that that requires a different sort of intervention uh, policy intervention and it's it's all connected so I think the good news is that finally in Europe we're also starting to see that. Um, in Japan, of course, we have seen the Trade and Investment Promotion Agency, JETRO, and the bank, uh, JBIC, uh, and the uh, International Cooperation Agency working in, as a sort of a more of a coherent whole uh, for, for many decades already, uh, whereas in, in Europe, I think that's a relatively new thing. So uh, perhaps with that in mind also, could we, uh, may I invite uh, Michiko or, or Mayumi to, to reflect on, on this from, from a Japanese perspective? Um, um, maybe I'll just try. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I think what uh, many of the things that Wilhelm said was very uh, kind of uh, pointing at the right direction, which is to uh, deal with the how to deal with the regulatory issues and then how to coordinate the governance uh, mode. And when I think about data, then I also reflect about then how what it 
done with the knowledge. And then there are a huge institution built around how to manage knowledge, which is intellectual property right. And then that is, I think that the uh, GDPR, uh, the European, start, European had started is a little bit similar to in, in that step, um, considering that the individual, individual property right to the data you, you generate rather than uh, the, 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 the American style of uh, platformer owning them or the state owning them in a Chinese style. This is like a middle ground. And I, I think there there is a little um, coincidence or the, 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 the um, similarity with the data flow with trust type of understanding. So I think there is a scope of kind of generating the understanding and then this kind of um, uh, concept or the, the um, framework of understanding about how, how, to, how, how you uh, consider the data, because I think the data is the core of what uh, the um, connectivity would bring about to uh, the next stage. Um, I, so I, I think that that would be uh, one of the things that uh, maybe uh, Japan as well as Europe would be able to kind of dialogue and try to uh, uh, come with an uh, understanding when they go on to international uh, cooperation. I give it back to you, Maike. Thank you. Yes, thanks for, for, for adding to that. Uh, Mayumi, did you uh, want to also engage with this question? Uh, yes, just one word. Um, yes, for, but to be honest, to I mean, do the... I mean, we used to have a lot of projects uh, within this ODA framework uh, in investing in including the infrastructure component. But now, because the private sector is, is quite active and uh, we, we are not really uh, main, uh, let's say, uh, player in this field. And of course, we uh, collaborate with JBIC and Jetra, as you mentioned, uh, to, uh, to like, OK, we, we are more on the enabling environment side or uh, capacity building side but we encourage the private sector to come in and of course as Wilhelm mentioned that it, uh, if um, whether Japanese companies are uh, you know competitive enough to go into the markets like in Cambodia for example I, 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 I yeah there's a lot of question in this field yeah that's it from my side But um, what about, uh, well, we don't have big telecommunications companies, obviously, in the Netherlands, but, uh, but in Europe, definitely so. We have uh, two, two champions, Nokia and Ericsson. How would the Netherlands feel about uh, the, you know, digital for development, the, the bigger picture, uh, not just the development instruments, but the bigger picture being pushed a little bit by, with, uh, with EU instruments? That's something I think we were hesitant. Uh, to sort of allow or encourage uh, a few years ago, but is that mindset changing now also? Well, to start, like I, I see that the invest the investments in, in infrastructure are always a bit problematic because of the high costs that are involved. So, from a government perspective, like the, the donors, let's say, like uh, are hesitant to invest in that because they want to leave it to the market, but then the market doesn't really pick it up, or the markets in the U.S. and China are picking it up. Uh, so that's 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 an issue um, which I, I I see on a daily basis. Also within Europe, there is discussions that I follow. Of um, of course, there's the recently there is the the Global Gateway Initiative of the of the European Union, which among other things tries to uh, contribute to additional investments in uh, digital infrastructure. But what you see in the background is that countries are still hesitant to invest in that. Um, because because the, the Global Gap Initiative, of course, is just a pooling of, 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 of already existing uh, funds uh, because of, yeah, you know, like uh, maybe others will pick it up anyway, or the market should do that, but then the market doesn't pick it up. Uh, maybe one reflection on, on some other things that were said. I think that Europe does have some cards in its hands uh, with which it can influence the discussion. For example, there is, uh, well, the Global Gateway, of course, is a way to, again, to, uh, to seek that, that collaboration within Europe in, as far as infrastructure developments are concerned. Um, but there's also things uh, like uh, the Digital Services Act, uh, with which the European Union tries to uh, regulate things like the algorithms and the, the, basically the things that, that, that caused the Googles and the Facebooks and the Tencents to become so big. 
Um, and I sometimes wonder, is, is there the, the reason why those tech companies are so big in the US and in China, is that, does that have something to do because they're doing way, things way better? Or, or is it because the European model, which also from a European perspective is more human centric, just doesn't bring up these sort of big companies because there's regulation, there is ways of antitrust and whatever, you know, to, to make sure that uh, the human element isn't uh, uh, lost. Um, and I think another thing is, so the Digital Services Act, I think there's a lot of influence uh, from the European side potentially to, uh, to regulate the, also the, the, the global market as far as infrastructure and uh, digital services is concerned. And, um, and there's other regulations, of course, with which we can set an example uh, for uh, other kinds of like the GDPR and like other things I've already mentioned. We, we do notice that uh, from, from our talks with, uh, with developing countries, and in, indeed, Wilhelm mentioned, we're doing a project uh, with a Cambodian partner for EU ASEAN cooperation. Uh, we do see an interest indeed uh, from those countries in, in regulatory uh, dialogues uh, with European countries. Um, and GDPR is, is one for data protection, uh, Digital Services Act, uh, as you mentioned, Bart, is another. Um, but there's indeed also the AI Act that, uh, you know, we're yeah, relating to what, uh, what Mayumi was saying uh, about the importance of, you know, how do we deal with, uh, with AI. Um, and so that, that regulatory element seems indeed to be, to be quite developed. Um, next to cyber, perhaps, um, we've heard of, of one project I, I mentioned earlier um, that's wherein the US and the EU and, uh, and Japan have been cooperating. Um, it's remarkable though that it's sort of difficult to, to try and establish where that is actually hosted. Um, you know, who is actually doing this? Um, because it, it, as you said, uh, Bart, I think it's the cyber, uh, department that's probably dealing with it and then you you know if, if the other departments don't know about this um, you know how can you really get to a coherent whole so that's that seems to be areas where where the Netherlands is, is has been quite active and and is sort of starting to to coordinate and work with uh, Japan um, but but indeed the more uh, the, the skills, the capacity building uh, and and the underlying hardware are perhaps um, elements uh, where we could coordinate uh, a little bit more. And, uh, and, and for that, you need indeed your own players. Uh, a European uh, analyst uh, famously said, you know, uh, the referees don't win matches, right? So we need to have our own, uh, you know, big champions that can uh, really uh, build from bottom up also these norms and, uh, and contribute to, to uh, the, the human center development that, that came up several times. Um, for now, I don't see uh, specific questions in the in the chat. Um, so I would like to just go once more to our panelists and see, um, you know, if they want to respond. So much has been said uh, by them, uh, and and I think you know, just going back to Wilhelm first um, to reflect, perhaps on you know, pick up on on one of the things that that one of the other panelists uh, highlighted uh, that you think indeed is important and that you perhaps want to add uh, to. Um, yes, thank you very much. Well, I'd like to pick up basically on what Bart just said. Obviously, the European Union, when it comes to digital development, is just starting base, basically projects. Obviously, the European Union now has an Indo-Pacific strategy, like the Netherlands and uh, the France and Germany and a few other countries. So Europe has kind of discovered the Indo-Pacific, obviously not for the first time, but kind of rediscovered this. Um, and uh, well, I would like to come back what I just said very initially uh, is the Europe's focus, of course, has been on Africa so far, and Europe has a lot of experience in Africa, but the, the situation in Africa is quite different, right? In Africa, it is really the digital divide. There needs to be really practical development. People are not yet online to the same degree as they are in the Indo-Pacific. And so when you turn to the Indo-Pacific, that is indeed one of the biggest challenges because that is not the problem in the Indo-Pacific. People are online, even in less developed countries, 90% of the population is in some way online. And so, of course, that brings other challenges. That brings, of course, all these challenges that comes with people being online, i.e. 
they can be manipulated. There is, of course, this whole problem of surveillance technology that is probably widely used, I think, in the Indo-Pacific, and I speak here much more broadly. Of course, it's used at different levels in different countries uh, than it is in Africa. So from a European perspective, there's a lot to learn, I think, maybe including to learn from the Japanese side because they have more experience there. But of course, the Europeans have also their own contribution. I mean, GDPR is kind of one, one of these things that is mentioned, but um, in terms of ex one is experience in Africa, but uh, the Europeans will lose out because, as I said, um, the Internet used to be very Western, obviously, originally American, European and a few other European countries. That is already no longer the case. As I said, 50 percent of the Internet population, so to say, probably the number might be 55 percent now, is in, in the Indo-Pacific and not in Europe. So in terms of influence of, of the discourse, the more general discourse, how it's used, how it's manipulated, is no longer really, even now, not really anymore in the hands of the Europeans and the Americans, although we oftentimes think that's the case. From a, it looks like that from Europe or from America, but in reality, it actually it's not. When you are in the Indo-Pacific, it's not. That's not the case, including many of these companies. I mean, even companies, yeah, Facebook is maybe the one exception that is still very powerful in many regions. But otherwise, these regions, including Japan, uses other services, right, um, um, in terms of chatting. And so, you know, because this seminar is about, you know, Japan and, and uh, the EU in particular, I think there, there is a lot of picking up to do or catching up to do rather in terms of working together. Uh, there's far too much talk, if I can be blunt. Uh, there are all these forums, including on cybersecurity, and there are once a year regular reading uh, meetings. But what I'm missing very often, um, and that's not a complaint to you or Bart, of course, but generally is like the activity, what comes next? Um, um, connectivity or sustainable connectivity is, is another example in a way that was hosted basically in the European External Action Service. But um, one begins to wonder what it's still new. So from 2018, 19 or so since a few years in the making, but has it achieved anything apart from reports and talks? I'm not so sure. That would be more a question than really an answer here, but kicking off a discussion. Thank you. Fair enough, Wilhelm. I, I've heard actually the, uh, I, I believe it was the Australian ambassador to, to Germany also say that, you know, they are, you know, Australia is now very much uh, investing and it's just, yeah, taking a lot of time to, to get to an infrastructural, uh, digital infrastructure project in, in Asia. Um, and he was wondering, you know, when are we going to see that indeed, um, you know, because the, the, the launch of the, the Global Gateway as such is definitely not going to do this. At the same time, of course, we've seen in, you know, EU Latin America, that big Bella project project uh, for some cable, uh, submarine cable connectivity um, that has come uh, come about. Um, so perhaps we can expect something uh, here also um, from, from Europe. Um, question mark. So Bart, that's uh, one perhaps later for you. Do you see flagship projects coming, uh, coming up? Uh, are they being uh, discussed or highlighted? Um, and perhaps with that also, if I could uh, poke um, uh, Michiko, um, if, if she's aware actually, for example, of, of a project that the EU has been doing in the ASEAN uh, to develop uh, digital indicators, uh, digital and economy and society index uh, has been uh, around in Europe for a while um, to, to really understand where the various countries stand on, on you know, connectivity, the hardware of it, but also the software, because even if you have the infrastructure available, you need still the connection to access the internet, right? Um, and, and all different kinds of, of indicators that, um, well, we are now measuring in Europe. Uh, the EU has tried to take to ASEAN, um, but we've been working with the ASEAN Secretariat mostly. And perhaps for that reason, it's not been so visible apparently in, uh, in, in ASEAN member states, uh, which is of course a real pity because that's where it's supposed to deliver. That's where those, having those indicators is supposed to bring 
uh, about better policy making because you know knowing is uh, is actually you know the the, the beginning of good policy making. Um, so have you seen you know is, is that uh, in some some way also um, you know how's that related to your work on on SDI? Are you aware of these you know yeah? Are do you hear about these sort of initiatives? Um, Yes, um, thank you. Um, well, some of the indicators are very, very important uh, policy tool in order to reflect upon the uh, current policy. Um, but uh, when I was listening to Wilson, I'm sorry, it's, I kind of I was had a train of thought coming from the um, different angle, uh, but related to that is the, the weather that you, you, you're talking about indicator. An indicator has a predetermined understand notion of what is right. But then whether it is always right or not, I was kind of wondering about, uh, with particularly thinking about the infrastructure, we tend to think infrastructure has to be developed in a large scale. But uh, when I look into some of the cases in Indonesia, some of the connectivity are brought about by mobile phone, not the internet. And internet is not very popular a means of uh, connectivity, but it's a mobile phone. And then uh, financial inclusion that are brought about in Indonesia is much from much to do with the mobile phone and the rest of the Asia is also. So, uh, I mean, coming from the bottom up, maybe there are some alternative means of bringing the connectivity uh, to the people and then different ways and perhaps cheaper ways of dealing with the connectivity. Of course, I'm not saying that everything is replaceable with a mobile phone, but then there will be some alternative means to um, bring the connectivity to the people. And uh, we may be not looking into uh, that deeply and that would require um, more study. And I think it, for that reason, maybe the Asia could be an interesting uh, way, interesting, I don't know, option to, to understand what sort of things are taking place at the moment because of the population, as I will mention, and because of the income levels, where the people then sort of a, a little bit below, a little bit above middle uh, income, well, not not above, I'm, but low income strata is increasing, and that actually makes uh, things moving. And then um, it is very difficult to uh, try to develop infrastructure technology where the population is decreasing, whether the purchasing power is decreasing, like in Japan, like in Europe, unfortunately. And uh, that would actually make the Asia or the growing Asian country uh, attractive uh, place uh, to uh, collaborate and also to sort of experiment the new ways of understanding how the digital uh, can bring about a new type of um, connectivity and also well being. Back to you, Maki. So we need to be a little humble here indeed. Um, I think many of the giants, you know, the e-commerce giants in Southeast Asia, they're very local actually. Tokopedia, Grab, you know, that's, they don't need us uh, obviously for, for some of this um, uh, or some countries don't need us for some of this, but where, yeah. So knowing the needs indeed um, and, and our added value. Um, Mayumi, would you like to, um, yeah, engage with that or anything else in, in, in what the um, other panelists, perhaps specifically Bart said that you would like to engage with. Sorry, I've been a little bit uh, cut off uh, in the middle, but uh, yes, um, um, I, I think that uh, in Asia uh, context, um, okay, we haven't been really uh, been active in the digital uh, Sphere, so to say, and we're more focusing on the government side. But the private, if you look at the private sector, I mean, yes, as as you mentioned, they they don't really need us, and what they're looking for um, uh, maybe is more investment. And now, the, a lot of the discussion with the impact investment and ESG investment, this is more uh, is what we're um, looking as a as a tool to um, uh, bringing the digital transformation as a society uh, so you know the uh, in terms of uh, i mean of course the infrastructure is uh, is important but also like a kind of ecosystem for innovations and applying these technologies to real serve the people is also uh, uh, quite uh, um, important and and I, I, and then so yeah 
but but for in in terms of uh, cooperation with the the uh, Europe, yes, uh, because you are really uh, leading uh, in the world with the norms and and regulations or or how you know the conceptualization of uh, this. Uh, how how to to kind of protect the people from all all this uh, because there's also always risks, right? And, and and so yeah, I was just wondering, but but if we, we if we sell, I mean <laughs> not sell, but if we bring our proposal to the governments, uh, if, if we just bring the norms, they they don't buy it, right? So what what is it to be? I mean to attract not to attract or to bring in the more interests or you know I, I think we should kind of uh, have a more, uh, yes, as you said, coordinated way, uh, and then also uh, uh, more at the higher level uh, to um, to really uh, bring attention to the vulnerable people who might be, uh, you know, left behind uh, from all those developments. So, I, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's my uh, comments. Thank you. Maybe very specifically in Japan, as, uh, as I said, I think trade and investment promotion and development cooperation for, for many years has gone more hand in hand compared to in Europe um, in recent decades. Um, so, so in this sort of digital for development field, um, do you work, uh, do, you, do you engage a lot with the digital companies or the, the, does JETRO have also already, uh, the, so the Japanese Trade and Investment Promotion Agency, do they have a specific branch for, for the digital companies and, and do you engage with them? Is that already going hand in hand also? Actually, not not in full swing, I would say, because the the players even in Japan for uh, these uh, digital applications in the in the society are much more the startups and these companies we haven't really really working together because we've been working more closely with the big giant uh, big traditional companies, you know, like. Uh, uh, like uh, like Shou Shao or uh, like uh, you know the big names and uh, and then I think Jetro is quite uh, in 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 advanced uh, uh, trying to promote them in uh, in Asia especially ASEAN countries and, and then we collaborate of course but we don't have a specific um, let's say um, the windows for that but we are now I mean in my department we are recreating a sort of a small uh, gateway <laughs> to, to bring in the, the, the startup companies with you know good solutions like I think you like in all the countries in Europe are doing in Africa and try to be very specific with what problems that they can solve in in particular area uh, in Asia and then we try to collaborate the, the, the issue is that we don't want to bring the Japanese solution you know as per se uh, bringing without any customization to the Asian countries they don't want that right so we, we need to kind of localize it or be more creative in uh, adapting to the local context and then we trying for that but still a lot to go <laughs> thank you so much that's that's very very interesting um, perhaps I would like to ask the same question to Bart and then round up our practitioner's input and uh, after Bart for a final turn to uh, um, to Michiko and, and Wilhelm to, to round the webinar off because we're already uh, getting close to our, um, our end time. Um, so, so Bart, engaging with this question first on, um, you know, how do you engage with the companies? Is, is that uh, also on your agenda, um, getting them more on board? We know the Netherlands is strong on fintech, for example. We have Holland fintech. We know that they engage with, with Brussels on the, on the standards and policy making. Is that something that you could use also in, in third countries or is that not quite yet on the agenda? Or any f other final remarks that you would like to make? Let me hear. Uh, yeah, certainly. Uh, we are exploring, of course, I mean, uh, for information, of, you know that, like the, the, the Dutch the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is organized and the development department is, is uh, one branch under one minister together with the uh, trade and development uh, part of the ministry. We are looking for those synergies, but uh, so far it's been proven difficult uh, to, to combine those two things. And, uh, Maybe I quickly also want to uh, reply to the things that uh, uh, particularly Wilhelm said. Uh, he was apologizing for being blunt in saying that he seemed to notice that there's a lot of talking, uh, but he was missing a little bit of action. And I think I encourage him to, to be more blunt and uh, everybody to be more blunt because it's, it's true. Um, it's, uh, it is a challenge. And from my perspective, I think that 
comes a little bit from or Europe is has always been a lot of talking, and then in the end, you know, like there is some action. And if you look back to the amount of talking, you think like, is this all we get out of it? Uh, but it has something to do with all that collaboration going on within the ministry, uh, my ministry, for example. There's a uh, hundred thousand different topics that the, uh, the, the political side of, of the ministry wants to uh, tackle, and then digitalization is one extra thing that is added to the mix. And I think what we need, and this is on the Dutch level, but the Germans and the Belgians and the French, they, I'm sure they have similar uh, struggles. And then those struggles and, and, and divisions end up at the European stage. And then you get even more talking and eventually something come out. And I have trust in that. But I think what we miss is clear priority, priorities uh, on digital development. Just This is the one thing that we're going to do. Just like in the 80s, uh, uh, food security in Africa was one of the main things where we put all our money on. I think digitalization is the thing for the 21st century, but we need more blunt people to speak out so that politics will also change direction. So, Willem? And for Thank an you very much. Like, oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, I don't have anything more substantial to say. I, I concur with that. And I'm, I, I'm happy to work with, with Bart and, and others in the in the EU system as well on this. Obviously, we are just kind of in the beginning of this. I, I can just kind of repeat what I what my idea was that I said in the beginning that a lot of the things, you know, even the geopolitical developments that we have seen over the last few years and we have probably continue to be seeing in the in the coming years are in some one way or another also related to digital. It's not exclusively, but also related to digital. I think surveillance might be one, privacy might be another one, how governments use, misuse technology, the whole idea of disinformation, misinformation. All of these things, of course, cannot be ended from one day or another, but of course, they're all in some way related to the governing of cyberspace, uh, of the internet more broadly. And of course, not the Europeans coming in, we clean up the mess and we know how things are done. Of course, there is a lot of talking involved, but sometimes there needs to be much more activity and it's not just one hyphenated policy, one hyphenated policy al along many others. These other, will, these other will continue to exist, but they're kind of, as I said, kind of on top and they cover a lot of things that are related and make other policies better and more effective, whether it's e-government, e-health, e-education, so on and so forth, that we have obviously gone through and experienced even more in the last two years <laughs> under the, the pandemic. But if I have, I don't know, the last word, but one word, I'd like to, to thank Maike and the Klingendal Institute for organizing this. This is a really a great, um, almost kickoff event, I think, where we're still in the beginning of this process. Uh, where I'm still hopeful that uh, there will be developments, there will be progress, and there, of, of course, will be talk as well. But at the end of the day, at least when it comes to Japan and the EU, and I'm, you know, originally European, but uh, in, in Tokyo right now, that there's more collaboration because a lot of that has to do or depends on, well, like it or not, middle powers. You talked about Australia, there might be Canada coming in, um, and a few other players as well. Uh, that we need this balance coming from these countries. Otherwise, it is the United States and it's China and countries like ours, I have to say, will lose out if we don't at least try to uh, have some influence uh, in this realm. But again, thank you very much, um, uh, Maike, uh, first of all, uh, for this interesting kickoff event. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wilhelm, for a, for a passionate, you know, sounds like closing remarks. I, I do want to turn to Michiko, uh, you know, in the, right in my screen, if you want to have, uh, did you have final points that you want to make still? Yeah, it's going to be very much similar to what uh, Wilhelm said, which is the, that, that we are at the uh, trajectory. Uh, we are probably at, uh, sitting in the kind of window of opportunity to whether to influence where it's going, that the digital uh, connectivity. And uh, as he was saying, and also as the other are also saying that uh, there is uh, the issue of who is governing, that the, who has a platform and who has a means to govern like data and then who has the skills to do so. And there are um, now in the a little bit uh, uneven ground. And uh, we are sitting here and if we don't talk a lot and not act, <laughs> maybe um, it is going to be uh, too late. I guess, 
and and that and then if we were to make some changes in the trajectory where it's going and it's we would like this to be going in a level field uh, and in a, a sustainable manner then uh, a lot of country needs to speak up and and collaborate to uh, kind of deal with the two giant uh, which we have uh, obviously at us and, and and china and trying to find a middle way of how uh, this uh, connectivity, digital connectivity and the data uh, uh, can be uh, used so that our uh, world in the future uh, can be reshaped in a more sustainable manner. So I thought this event was uh, great. So that bringing together uh, various people's perspective and very in, and in the very um, focused area of digital uh, development. So I congratulate uh, Maike, and I also uh, very much uh, learned a lot from all the participants. So I thank you very much uh, for the, organizing this event. So I, back to you, Maike. Wonderful. Thank you uh, to all the four of the panelists, of course, uh, for, for a wonderful uh, debate, which indeed feels like the beginning of something. Um, this is uh, a relatively new topic and uh, things have been brewing for a while, but now it really seems like the time that we have to get to priorities, perhaps, and to, to real projects, as, as Bart was highlighting and several others as well. Um, so let's hope that uh, the analysts here and uh, also in, in, uh, in, the, in the audience, of course, will uh, be allowed to contribute to that um, with uh, sharing more ideas uh, and, and pushing more debate, um, sometimes more and, or sometimes perhaps less blunt, but I think uh, both is important. Um, so it, thank you very much. Uh, most of the people who joined us from the start are still with us. Um, so it's uh, wonderful to actually um, well see that and to continue the discussion at a later point of time. Thank you for all for being here uh, and until that next time.